Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to see this uh, large audience interested in machine learning and big data. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and, and uh, take you to a slightly different domain, which I believe is going to, uh, to be quite central in the near future of uh, both theoretical machine learning in, in its largest sense, uh, more, more than just data analysis, and even more in uh, industrial applications of machine learning. Uh, and this is really systems that combine sensing and behavior. I mean, so we are moving essentially from essentially <laughs> sensors and data analysis done by humans into devices like uh, this uh, familiar pioneer, the, the cleaner robot, that uh, is amazingly simple. I mean, has a, a very simple automaton in it, which uh, has absolutely no tunable parameters after we, we, set, we get it. <laughs> Of course, there, there's some sophistication that was invested in, in its design, but what is really interesting about it, it has both sensors and actuators, and it's moving around, and it's supposed to pretend to clean our apartment such enough for us to pay for it. And uh, this type of device is, is, uh, has a certain level of information processing, which I call uh, metabolic information processing. So in some sense, it has uh, sensors that uh, collect uh, data from the environment, like uh, the bumper that fills the walls, or some optical sensor that may, may feel some dirt, or the quality of the floor, and so on. It may even have some uh, long-range long, long range sensors, like uh, filling back the, uh, some homing device back to the charger, and so on. But basically, it's a, it's a very simple, what you may call stupid system, and in its information processing, it's actually gathering information and immediately using it in most cases. So it's, it's a very short cycle of sensing acting or acting sensing, and we'll see immediately what the difference between these two. And uh, the challenge to a theoretician like me is really to see what is really the optimal design of such a machine in terms of investing in sensors versus memory, versus computation, versus actuators, what is really the right balance between the processing, the capacity of the sensors, and the resolution of the sensors, and so on, and the complexity of the actions. And when you think about it, I mean, this is really a very fundamental question. Of course, it's the, perhaps the most fundamental questions in biology. I mean, any, any living organism is doing something like this, I and mean, essentially sensing the environment and then act. So, in principle, this type of, uh, of information processing is, is, is uh, common and stupid, and we would like to think that there is no learning after the design. Uh, somewhat more sophisticated uh, problem is what we call planning, like chess playing or something like this, where you need to consume information, but you redesign or you replan your actions after you receive the information. It's not an immediate response to the action. There's some sort of a long-term goal, and we usually solve such problems with, with some sort of dynamic programming, or we, we look ahead, we, we, need, we know where we are now, we, we know where we want to be, and backward, we infer the optimal actions right now. And as you know, there's a very well-developed theory of optimal control that's exactly telling us how to design and engineer such systems. But of course, when you think about this, there's actually an in, a dual problem to the planning, which is very often ignored by, by engineering, by, by control engineers, which is really the learning problem. I mean, and, and I'll come back to this. I mean, these two problems are really back to back in a sense. We sense and act and act and sense in a way which is dual to each other, and we really can't solve the planning problem completely without dealing with learning. And of course, there is a, a higher level problem where we which is, let's say, more complicated than chess, where we really don't know the, the rules of the games at all. We, unlike chess, where everything is observed and the rules are known in advance, in general, we are exploring some unknown environment. We need to learn the rules while playing. And we may get new tools and new areas in the, in the, on the floor, on the, on the, which is different, never seen before. And we need to do some exploration 
exploitation, we need to do some stupid moves in order to discover things that we don't know now. So unoptimal in some, in the control theoretic sense. And this is really what we are really interested in, where we need to learn while acting. In all of those cases, we hardly do what we call batch learning. I mean, first collect the data, process, and then act. We always do it together, and these two things really are intertwined. So, uh, you know, I'm coming from physics, as you, as you heard, and physicists, unlike computer scientists, believe in principles. And uh, they also believe that there's some unifying method, unifying principle that really solves everything. This is some sort of religion. But, uh, so I really don't care about algorithms. I, I, I care about what is really behind all these problems. Is there a way of thinking about them in one common language? And uh, as I just told you, I mean, biology is all about precisely understanding this. If you, one of my favorite definition of what the brain is doing, coming from a, the famous book of Joachim Fuster on the frontal cortex, essentially telling us that what organisms, what the brain is doing is what we call perception action cycle or sensing acting cycles on multiple time scales. And he, he defines essentially this cycle as the circle of flow of information that takes place between the environment, the organism and its environment in the course of a sensory guided sequence of behavior towards the goal. This is really, and trying to understand to make sense of this sentence is really one of my primary goals in life. And indeed, our brain is largely speaking, that's what it does. I mean, it's gathering information through our sensory uh, apparatus, whether it's vision or audition or, or touch or smell or whatever. And uh, eventually, try to compress or gather out of this huge data, big data if you want, uh, only the little tiny pieces of relevant information which is eventually going to be useful in the immediate or somewhat less immediate future. Everything else is irrelevant. And this is of course true also for all of you who are trying to make sense of big data. I'm going to actually prove to you that only a tiny fraction of this huge data is really important. I can really quantify how much how tiny? The point is, of course, to find methods of extracting this tiny fraction, this uh, relevant bits out of the huge amount of irrelevant bits. And that's precisely what biology is all about. That's precisely what, what, what our brain was evolved to, to do. And we do it, as I said here, on, on multiple time scales. So there is this uh, little fast, what, what I call somatosensory, the touch, when I touch the the table here, I immediately feel a force back and I close a very, very fast cycle which is done in the center of our brain in the cortex within let's say 100 milliseconds. This is somatosensory immediate cycles but then there are longer and longer scales of cycles like this like when I walk I actually predict that the floor is there and I feel it, I close another cycle. When I speak to you now I actually think a few sentences ahead I suppose and I always plan ahead in some sense and trying to get there and bring you where I want you to be and so on. Actually, if you think about it, what really characterizes us as human beings more than I believe anything else is the fact which we actually learned somehow, invented some clever way of planning ahead, essentially indefinitely far into the future and actually remembering into the indefinite past. I mean, the fact that we actually have some sort of divergence of planning and memory horizons is really what makes us so unique and what gives us this consciousness, this mysterious thing that we are all after. Okay, so we are living in cycles of information flow with the environment and what I, the first thing I want to do is to somehow characterize quantitatively what, we, what are really the limiting or the minimal required, required information flow between us and the environment in order for us to to operate, to live, to live. So there is a, if you want this, there is this perception channel which really tells me how many bits of useful information is coming to me from the environment through all my sensory perceptions. And then there is this prediction or actuator or executive function, executive channel, which allows me to use these bits in a useful way. And I claim, and I'll convince you, you very soon, that these two channels are very tightly bind and balanced together and evolve together, and that there's a lot of coordination and, 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 and matching between the perceptual channel or the sensory channel and our 
accurate. So for example, our hearing system, the ears are very tightly matched precisely to the variations of the sound that we can make with our mouth, to speech. And, and of course, a lot of other things with it. And, and, and of course, we, we carry, we precisely receive the information in our ears, which we can modulate with our voice apparatus. Similar, even more interesting things happen with our vision, with our motor system, and so on and so forth. Actually, the only interesting exception to this is, is smell, but I'm not going to talk about it today. <laughs> Olfaction is different, because it's very, very old and it was not evolved that much. Anyway, so in a nutshell, my model of, of this cycle, which is also the model of the brain, is that we somehow need to compress, selectively sense the, the past, gather from this huge amount of data the tiny relevant bits, how much, how relevant, and what precise bits, precisely those that really allow us to make valuable predictions and actions, of course, and plans. And of course, if this is the model, I, I would like to give you, as I say, a toy or a, a, a caricature mathematical description that really captures this model and the value of, my, of caricatures, of simplified or oversimplified models is precisely because they allow us to formulate them using mathematics and play the games that especially physicists like to play, uh, re, re, make the, the problem ridiculous, and then get some very sophisticated conclusions out of very simple mathematical analysis, sometimes not so simple. So let's go back to this robot, to the cleaning robot. So are we really sure that this robot is not learning? Well, think about it. Of course, we can't be sure. Although there are no tunable parameters in the robot, the robot has two very important ingredients. It has sensors of the environment, and it has actions back to the environment. So it's not living in, 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 in vacuum, it's living in, in an environment. So for computer science, it's very clear that actually the robot, the cleaning automaton, can really treat, let's say, my apartment as a tape of a Turing machine. In a sense, it may organize the, the dirt in my room, such that it can read it and act by it. So actually, I really don't know that this robot is not learning. In order to really know it that it's not learning, I, I need to look not only at the robot, but also at its environment and its effect on the environment. OK. So I need some, of course, as it can sense, and we must include the environment in our analysis. And the next thing I want to do is to introduce, so how can I know that it's not learning? What is really the fundamental signature of learning. Okay, I'm, I'm sure that many of you heard it before, but is there one mathematical function that allow me to characterize learning and distinguish it from something which is not learning? Okay, so all of you are learning experts, and, and there's one function which I particularly like, which we invented a long time ago. I mean, actually, we started to talk about it sometimes in the 90s, uh, with Bill Bialik and actually following many other our discussions with, with Fernando Pereira is here and many others. Uh, what is really a quantity which we call predictive information and was, was essentially just rediscovering other complexity measures that, as you'll see in a minute that, that are very common to information theorists and to statistical physicists and to, and to computer scientists, of course, in various ways. And this is essentially how much, if I look at the process, some, it's not necessarily a symmetric process like this, but some sort of a stochastic process, but better, better be stationary process. And I open a certain window into the past at some length t, and then I open a similar, not necessarily the same, but let's say a similar window into the, into, into the future. And then if the process is stationary, I can in principle estimate the joint distribution of this past versus future within these windows. And I can ask myself how much information how many bits of useful information is there in the past with respect to the future? OK, so of course, the, the process is stochastic, so it has a finite entropy rate. And of course, in general, in order to describe it, I need number of bits which are linear, what we call extensive, in, in T. Because the, amount, the amount, number of possible configurations of, of, a, of a, a bit of a, a, a signal, stochastic signal is of size T is exponential in T, which means I need linear in T bits to describe it. But actually, the amount of mutual information, relevant bits in the past with respect to the future, and this is my connection with big data, is, is tiny. 
So if I look really at what we call I predictive as a function of the window size, simply the mutual information between the past and the future of a process, it's a rather simple exercise for most of you here to convince yourself that this cannot grow linearly with time. It actually, if I really exploit all the information that there is in the past or the future, it must grow sublinearly, or as physicists, we call it sub-extensively. And indeed, it's very easy to convince yourself that if there are only finite number of parameters to this process, let's say D, dim theta parameters of this process, let's say it's a Markov process or a Bernoulli process or something with finite number of parameters, those are the kind of things that we really usually like to apply machine learning to, then the amount of information as a function of the window size grows asymptotically logarithmically with T. Why is that? Because essentially when I know the parameters, I disconnect the past from the future. So everything in the past with respect to the future is in the encoding of these parameters. And the number of parameters, the number of bits that I can acu gather from the past about the parameters, from example, from the kramer rao bound, anything like this, is, is like, goes like square root of t, which means uh, that the, the variance goes like square, square root of t, which means that the number of bits grows like half log t. So for each parameter, I, I, I have essentially half log t information, and that's all the information in the past respect to the future. So all the relevant information in the big data for, for finite parameterized environments, in finitely finite dimensional environments, uh, grows like log t, which means only log t over t ratio of relevant bits are there. Can't be more. This is a low, a bound on the relevant information. So this is actually very interesting because this, of course, is directly related to things like the MDL or stochastic complexity or, or the VC dimension or many other things that you may have heard of in learning. This is not a bad, bad news, it's actually great news. This really means that even very limited brains like ours can deal with, with the highly complex environment simply by gathering only those tiny fraction of bits. The rest we can ignore, so we don't need huge memory in order to act essentially optimally. Only a tiny fraction of it. Unfortunately or fortunately, the, the, the real world is a little more complicated. And, and in, in general, we don't have finite number of parameters. We have complicated processes that can grow in complexity, like clustering with adding more and more clusters, or like language or music or anything interesting actually doesn't have a finite number of parameters. And it usually grows like a power law, where this alpha is in many cases just square root, I mean half. So, uh, and if it goes like half, it means that the, the fraction of relevant bits is one over square root of t, which is again very small, it's a small fraction. The, if you want to, to know what the connection between the predictive information and learning is actually very, again, easy exercise to convince yourself that the error, what we call the generalization error, the prediction error, how well I'm going to predict the next, the next point is going on average to behave like the derivative with respect to t of this, of this predictive information. So predictive information, here is a very easy test for learning. If the predictive information of the, of the system grows linearly with, with t, there's no learning because the, derivative, the error is not going to improve. If there is learning, it must grow sublinearly, and then it means that my prediction error is going to decrease eventually, and it grows like 1 over t in the finite dimensional case, as you all know, and it goes like some power law, like 1 over square root of t, in, in the infinite dimensional or in unrealizable cases. So this is a very nice connection between information and learning and learning error. So my signature or my, my candidate for testing is the learning in my system, is my cleaning robot really learns my environment, is by try, somehow try to, trying to estimate its predictive information with the environment. I cannot ignore the environment because maybe all the learning is done by rearranging the dirt in my room. Okay. So essentially, now you can plug this into, into this principle, and the principle is actually very simple. I somehow miss it here. The, the principle that, okay, I'll come, I'll come back to this, is, is essentially here is one unifying principle for learning in general. Try to minimize complexity subject to some sort of value or utility or error or whatever measure that you consider important. And in this case, complexity is measured by predictive information. So the unify, my unifying principle of learning, and much more than learning, it will see that it's learning and control and information processing, many other things, is minimize 
predictive information subject to utility or value constraints. Now, the, the first and simplest example for this is, is, is what we call Markov decision process. So Markov decision process is a, is a very elegant and, and easy to analyze, relatively easy to analyze a toy or toy model for environment and interaction. What we have there, we believe that the, the environment has some only finite number of states, not necessarily, but discrete states, uh, with some probability of transition between the states, uh, which essentially tell me the dynamics and possible actions that I can act on the environment. And so this probability, which may or may not be stochastic, I mean, may, this, this dynamics may or may not be stochastic, tells me essentially if you are at the state S and you do the action A, what is your probability of being at the state S prime next time? And on top of this statistical structure, this is why we call it Markov, because it's a Markovian structure, we put reward, which essentially is the value associated with this transition in action, local reward. And then we can define optimal planning in the way we do in optimal control, optimize the expected future reward. Okay, so sum over those rewards based on the probability of all the next to the future. And of course, I'm just running through it because I'm sure many of you know it. And if you don't know it, it's not going to help you much. But uh, essentially, you, 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 do, you solve problems like this using the mechanism of reinforcement learning, which means that you act, get from, move the environment to a new state, get the reward, and plan your next action, and so on. And the problem here is to find the optimal policy, which is what is the rule, what should I do if I know at what state I am now, now, by the way, the states are not necessarily the states of the environment. They can be my internal states in some sense. For example, if I think about the cleaning robot, I can think about it as an MDP, despite the fact that it doesn't have any clue of where it is in the world, but it still has it, its internal states, and I can gather what I should do based on my knowledge of internal states. So it's actually a richer model than you think. And what is really nice about this model is that it's solvable rather easily because I can because of the Markovian structure, I can break this long decision of a possibly exponentially many possible futures into a, using dynamic programming into step by step and optimize it step by step and essentially solve it in a linear time in my planning horizon. So this is beautiful. This is very useful. This is essentially the way, let's say, your GPS planners uh, work and, and many other things like this, which have to plan ahead in an, and sometimes these uncertainties. In the, in the future in the, of the environment. So if I look at, look, look, look at it in some, uh, in some uh, more general, I, I skipped uh, the, a crucial slide here, I'm sorry, somehow it is hidden. Uh, so I, I told you that my general principle here is to minimize the predictive information subject to my value. This is actually very different from what optimal control people do. Optimal control people try to find the optimal control, which means the maximum possible value. So they look for the policy or the actions that should actually maximize their returns or expected reward. But biology is never doing that. And if you ask any biology, biologist or any, or any machine learning purpose, people for that purpose, they'll tell you that there's absolutely no point in optimizing your policy. All you have to do is be good, better than your competitors or good enough. And good enough in that sense means that you want to be the simplest possible subject to some constraint on your value. So how, again, this, this principle can be easily cast into an optimization problem. Minimize the predictive information, which means assume the least possible about your environment in terms of information. Gather as little as possible information from the past with respect to the future, such that the value is satisfied. And in order to do this, we, we employ uh, principles for information theory because essentially what I want is to, is to minimize uh, predictive information which is an information theoretic quantity but I don't need to know what this information is so unlike what most people think that if I, I'm writing information, mutual information I immediately need to estimate it, I don't need to estimate it I'm using it as a, as a tool for optimization I never really measure the distribution completely but this is my generating function for optimizing the policy so it, as again, it's, it's a kind of idealized view of the world, and it's actually based on, on a very solid mathematics. One of them is, is called large deviation theory, which is really telling me what is, uh, this is also the basis for, for information theory, and it's the basis for statistical physics and many other asymptotic theories like this. Essentially, it's telling me what is the typical or the most likely behavior of your system subject to some constraints. And if I know those constraints, 
I can easily calculate this typicality by minimizing some information theoretic quantities or maximizing entropy, which is just the same thing. And learning theory is actually giving us even new, newer and, and, very, and very interesting criteria which, are, which lead to the same conclusion. The, again, it all boils down to the fact that this predictive information is closely related to the measure of complexity in learning or to generalization abilities. And, and therefore, uh, things like the pack-based bounds or, or the uh, general dimension or complexity control parameters uh, in learning theory give me essentially the same type of idea. So here is my unifying principle. Minimize predictive information subject to value utility. What is nice about this principle is it generalizes the standard complexity control principle. It, it generalizes standard complexity uh, control, which means uh, all the ERM and, and, uh, and uh, uh, other things that you do in learning all the time. So you have complexity measure, some sort of entropy or, or, or VC dimension or things like this, and then you want to control, control your complexity by minimizing it. This is a general, general version of this. And of course, what is really neat about this type of idea is that it unifies control and information theory into one picture. And why do I want to do this? Because, okay, because as I said already, I mean, both biological system and artificial system are, are precisely doing both things. So in some sense, what I'm trying to do here is it's, it's, it's a very modest task of trying to unify control, optimal control, which is most best associated by Bellman, also uh, the father of dynamic programming, with ideas uh, of information gathering and compression and error correction, which are usually associated by closed channel. So, so again, I, I'm doing it by applying ideas which coming from mathematics, and mainly this notion of uh, large deviations, which I don't have time to explain, but just believe me that there is a very solid mathematics behind the idea that you want to minimize information in order to achieve the typical behavior of the system. Okay, so now let's go back to the uh, acting sensing system. And the way I want to think about it is in terms of a, of a graphical model. So you, you have the world, the environment, as a Markov chain moving from time t to t plus one and so on. And it is affected by, in this directed graph, not only by the previous state, but also by my action. So this is the dynamics of the environment. And this is my memory of, of the mind of the organism. And uh, it's also moving like a Markov chain, which means it is affected by its previous memory and maybe by the observation or by the sensing that I receive at time t. And both the sensory observations and actions are local in the sense that they depend only on the current state of the environment and on the current state of my memory. So this is a very simple and very intuitive model, a graphical model, for describing these sensing acting interactions. Notice, by the way, that this is a directed graph and it's a causal model. So I don't have any, any loops that go backward in time and I don't have any problem with causal information or, any, or anything like this. Now, the, the question is, of course, what characterizes the typical behavior of this system? And this will give me a mathematical answer for the link between these two channels, how much information must go through the sensors and how, much, how is it related to information that must go through the actions or through the predictions. So the exercise is actually very simple. Of course, you, you assume that there is some sort of reward associated with the transition of the environment from state t to t plus one, which I call the extrinsic or the, the external reward, like something like energy or, 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 or computational cost, anything which you can measure outside which is associated with this triangle. So this is the external reward, or this is really the control theoretic cost, is associated with observing and then acting. So if you think about it, this is what we do in control. We first sense and then act, okay? But with it, the other side of the same coin, we also act and sense, which means that we ask questions, for example, and we get answers, or we do measurements, and we, we, we get information from the environment, and this act acting, sensing part of the cycle is usually ignored from some funny reason in, in control theory, but actually is amazingly important. You can't really talk about such a system without dealing with this cycle and with, with this triangle and with this triangle. But this triangle is associated with something completely different than the external reward. It's associated with the information gain, how much I actually learned from the response of the environment. This is active sensing, active learning, active anything. This is what we do all the time. So, uh, 
The way I, I deal with it is, again, without making a long, a, a long story short, I, I simply apply this principle of minimizing, minimizing predictive information subject to expected reward and apply it to this particular graphical model. Now, if I'm right that the robot is only doing metabolic information processing, which means it doesn't learn, I should get that the information, the predictive information is, sub, is, is linear in time after learning. So I can optimize it once with respect to, let's say, policy or, or sensors or whatever it is, and then eventually it doesn't learn. And indeed, that's what happens. So I, I apply this principle. I'll do it very quickly here to, in the MDP case without getting into too many details. Uh, the mathematics is a little bit, uh, it's funny, but it's really very simple. So I, like, I, I write this cross entropy between the future the condition on the past versus the with respect to the future unconditioned on the past, which is precisely the average of this, is precisely the predictive information, how much information is there in the past with respect to the future, and I minimize it subject to this MDP model and expected reward. And the nice thing about it is that you get immediately, just almost for free without cost, you get an, a dynamic programming extension of information gathering, and you get explicit expression for these two capacities how much information is needed for my actions and how much information is gathered by my, my sensors. And you immediately see, or you don't immediately see, that there's some analysis that first of all you can solve this problem very easily, efficiently, just as you solve the standard MDP case. And then you, you get a very nice connection between the compression, the, 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 the capacity of your sensors and the complexity of your actuators because I actually minimize, I'm squeezing as much as possible information out of my process in order to find this minimal complexity creature that still achieve my, my value. Okay, so the, the first thing that you get out of it is some interesting connection for any engineer. If you want to build a robot and send it to Mars, let's say, and you need to invest money in the camera versus the memory of the computer, what is more important? Where to invest, what's more important, me the memory capacity, which means how much I need to remember from the previous time, versus how much I want to sense on the environment. All, all you need to give me is some idea about how much the environment is changing, and I can answer this exactly. I mean, so despite its very theoretical look, this is a very practical question, and it's a very engineering-like question. And notice, by the way, that by combining these two things together, on the side, I also have a unified formalism and the unified equation for optimal control and for information gathering. They are just, as I said, the two sides of the same coin. Okay, so now, now when, when you get this, okay, let me just summarize it. So you get this uh, dual dynamic programming processes. One of them is the standard reinforcer to optimal control interaction with the environment. And the other one is the, what I call the information gathering cycle every act that they do gives me some rewards and move the environment to a new state, and at the same time is giving me some information, delta i, and all I need to do is to combine these two, two equations together in a formalism which looks very much like statistical physics, like energy and entropy or things like this, and, and you immediately can uh, optimize it because you have dynamic programming for both of them, and let me skip those details. The nice thing is, that of course you get that the optimal agent in this case is not acting deterministically, it's acting stochastically, which means imagine your GPS planner not doing, giving you a deterministic path, but a, a distribution over many passes, and whenever you come to a junction, it tells you, look, it doesn't matter if you go from left to right, flip a coin. And essentially it flips a coin for you. In many cases, this is uh, what you should do, and this is a lot cheaper in terms of knowledge and information that you need to know about the future. Okay, this problem is solved. So we know how to deal with metabolic information processing. I want to go to the much more interesting, this is by the way the type of uh, results you get from this analysis. You get nice curves which give you bits on one end and value on the other. <laughs> and essentially it's really giving you how much you need to know about the future in order to achieve a certain value. This looks very much like a rate distortion function information theory. It tells you what is really the value of information about the process or how much you really need to gather. You know, and you see that, for example, to solve this very simple S-like maze, I need something like 70 bits, which I mean I need to make 70 binary decisions along the way in order to get to the end. But actually with 30 bits or with less, I can get essentially the same value 
where half of the bits are random, okay? So which means that this environment is relatively simple. There are very few critical decisions, and those critical decisions are precisely those red regions where you need to know what you're doing. Nice. By the way, this is the answer to every intelligence officer who's asking you how much you really need to know about the future. You need to know exactly those minimal bits and not more than that. That's what you really need to gather. Here is another neat example. If you want to go through a minefield, for example, if you, if you, if this is, these mines, you don't want to step off them, but if you solve the optimal control problem, it will take you through a path like this, <laughs> assuming that you really need to know every mine, where every mine is, but if you solve this relaxed uncertainty control, it will take you around, and this is very, very different from the type of, of, of learning algorithms that you apply in, a, in a, using a RL, even with a softmax, but this is just for the experts. So this is, of course, the right solution in this case. Don't do, go into the minefield if you don't have to. Okay. So what is really nice about it, again, coming from physics, that it gives you some set, certain connection between the reward, the expected reward rate on average, and the capacity of these two channels. How much information the action has need to get from the current state of the system, and how much you gather by the response of the system to your action. And these two things, the sum of them is simply up to a constant, the average reward in your behavior. Nice, so this is something which, again, for a physicist, looks very much like the first law of thermodynamics, because it's a sum rule that connects energy and entropy, or energy and information. Uh, what is learning? And this is what the main part of, of my talk, okay? So, there's something which I'm, I'm sure all of you know intuitively at least. There is a duality, which I infer to all the time, between these two problems of planning ahead in the future and gathering information in the past. Actually, all of you who learned even a little bit of control theory know that the, this duality starts with duality between something we call controllability and observability, which means somehow these two problems are related to each other. The fact that I'm controlling the environment and observing the state of the system are somehow one and the same, the two, two sides of the same problem. This duality actually extends much further to a, the duality between estimation and control, and eventually what I call the duality between planning and learning. Now, the duality between planning and learning is deep in the sense that if you solve one problem, you actually have to solve and know how to solve the other problem. Usually we don't think about it this way because learning people don't think about control and control people hardly think about learning. It's not really true, but it used to be true. So this duality of planning and learning tells me something very fundamental about the way our gathering of information in the past, or essentially getting the relevant information from the big data, has to be done. And it should be done by essentially learning about planning. So here is another piece of... Uh, Psychophysics, which is actually quite interesting for, for vision people. We used to think that vision is done what we call bottom-up. If you, if you think about the, the Ma picture of vision, this is for you, Freddy. So essentially, we have these uh, very low-level sensors like orientation and color and so on, and they're integrated in the visual system up to some higher level where we see the objects like faces, cars, houses, and so on. And that's what we always thought until more or less 15 years ago, that this is the way the vision system must work, from the details to the large objects. But what we know now, and again, I'll, I'll make a very interesting short story short, that vision works very much like speech recognition, in the sense that we don't really test the acoustics of every signal from the details and then construct from it the, world, the words, but we first guess the words and then check that they're really there. So everyone who worked on speech, or on language in general, knows that, that any speech recognition system is based on a language model which, ha which is making predictions. And then once you have very few hypotheses, very few choices of words, you go back to the details of the acoustics. Here, the same thing is true about vision, the same through, thing is true for all our perception. We first guess and then see. So of course, the, the interesting, uh, obvious question is, how do we guess if we don't see? I mean, okay, so of course we need to use somehow the context or the past of our sensory information in order to, mess, to make educated guesses. So when I see you here, of course I don't care about all the, the, the little details. I'm asking myself, is this uh, a guy I know? There are only a few choices. I immediately check the one, two, three, four, five hypothesis 
tests that I have to do, and this is very efficient and immediate, and they immediately get the answer. And then I make, if, I, if I'm wrong, I'm making another choice, another hypothesis, and so on and so forth. So it's quite obvious today, and it's really based on very elegant psychophysics done in, in brain science. For example, the work of Merava uh, Chisane and Hosten. Uh, Charles Hochstein, which really told us that essentially vision is going backward in what we call reverse hierarchy. Now, this should remind you something for planning. The Bellman equation, or anything which looks ahead, you first need, like, like, like your GPS planner, you first need to know where you want to be, and only then you go backward and make, infer backward using dynamic programming or something like this, what you need to do now. Now, vision is exactly that. I mean, you first guess and then and then, and then uh, uh, check. And of course, it's based on multiple hypothesis testing and planning. So this is just a, a very short course in what I call modern perception theory. And if you apply my duality principle, the hierarchy should somehow come from this very fundamental principle that I'm suggesting, is that our planning is not done in terms of equal times, as it's done in the MDP, but actually in terms of equal information. And actually, the, it makes perfect sense. So if I, let's say I want to, like any, I'm sure all of you have done it before, I mean, you want to plan a, a tour, a trip of, let's say, one month somewhere, it's absolutely ridiculous and useless to try to plan all your days in the same resolution. I mean, you, you, you should plan the first day more or less carefully, and then the next week, and then the next month, and so on, in the same resolution more or less. If you're trying to do more than that, you overfit, you, you assume too much, you assume too much about the future, which means that you are wasting both effort and making assumptions that are probably wrong. So don't plan your breakfast two months from now. It doesn't make sense, unless you're going to be in the same place and nothing's going to change. Now, so which means, in terms of my predictive information curve, that if I'm working in equal units of information, which means equal units of complexity, equal no units of knowledge about the future, my time is immediately stretched and if this is a logarithmic function, it will actually stretch exponentially, as in this picture. Which means that my first unit of time and my next state is going to be here. My sec next state and state after that is going to be twice as long in time, and the next one twice again, and so on and so forth. So my computational challenge, or my algorithmic challenge, was here to try to design a way of dealing with this type of fisheye view of the future, which means I'm actually seeing the near future in very high resolution, and the further I go, the more compressed it is, put it back into the optimal control or the Bellman-like formulation. So this was a challenge that took us about two years to, to, uh, to really uh, more or less solve, and the surprise is, that actually the solution was in our hands a long time ago, Joram Zwinger is here, no. but actually some of it is coming from his PhD 20 years ago, uh, which is really the fact that we can really learn automatons something like prediction suffix automatons and things like this, which the number of states really grows only polynomially in the time and not exponentially in the time. And the fact that we can do this really allows us to solve this, uh, what I call renormalization of the Bellman equation, which means write the Bellman equation, which really works with lo longer and longer states and still is recursive in the sense that I can still operate with it. And the way it works, again, just to give you the gist of it, if, you, if these are your original state of the world, and these are your original actions, your planning action has to be stretched. I mean, so the first action has to be the original action, but the next action has to be some sort of cluster or compression of the next two actions, and then the next action has to be some sort of compression of the next four actions, and the same is true about the states. So I need to renormalize, as we call it in physics, to, to move to larger and larger scales of actions and, and, and states such that this tilde, S tilde and A tilde will satisfy some sort of a Bellman equation again. So in some, some sense I'm moving my MDP or my POMDP structure from the original structure into this renormalized structure and the whole trick, the difficulty, computational difficulty is really how to find this, this transformation. And then once I do this, I solve my policy in terms of sort of renormalized re actions and states. Then I think about it, first of all, even without solving it, you immediately see two interesting consequences. First of all is the issue of discounting. So uh, I don't know how many of you worked with RL, but there's this, always this uh, tricky business of how do you discount future rewards. And of course in control theory, 
or in uh, RL, we usually uh, discount exponentially. Why? Because it's easy mathematically. Actually, there's no fundamental reason for doing it. But if you did this renormalization trick, you see immediately that in order for this to make sense, in order for my information to go, or information about the future, to scale correctly with the value, I need to discount the, the true reward. And in the case of logarithmic predictive information, I get an exponential discounting. And in the case of a power law predictive information, I get immediately hyperbolic discounting, which is again what people see in economics and in psychophysics and so many other places. So this is the first thing that really makes you happy. This principle leads to some predictions. Give me the structure of the environment, I'll give, I tell you how to discount. And notice, by the way, that the discounting is part of the renormalization transformation, and it's not part of the, the original algorithm. And of course, then you have a, essentially a, some, some sort of a Bellman-like equation, which is involved, again, information and, and, and reward. And again, I don't want to get into it. Just believe me that we know how to solve this uh, for many, many different place cases where you can actually design an automaton which actually uh, uh, solves this, uh, this problem. So actually, there are some people in the audience who think that they are working on this problem, so I don't want to spoil their surprise, but it's, <laughs> it's really not trivial and there are not that many possible solutions. And this is really one thing that is nice about this type of game. In order for this solution to be consistent, it turns out that there are only very specific scenarios or very specific se selections of actions and sensors that really make this happen. And again, for the control theorist among you, it turns out in the, in, the non, in the linear case, it boils down to something like minimal representation of linear systems, uh, uh, which is some sort of a canonical correlation analysis of some, uh, of some Henkel matrix or whatever. If I, if I, if, if I insulted anybody, I'm sorry. But, and, and, and if the, in the nonlinear case, it's much more interesting because it goes back to some sort of irreducible representations of Lie algebras, which is really beautiful because it tells us again that the possible solution to these type of equations are very constrained, which means that systems that actually plan ahead must have a very specific type of sensors and actuators that go together. And this again brings me uh, ideas from physics uh, that physicists among you may find it familiar because in physics we do it all the time this type of uh, reductions. Anyway, I'll, 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 uh, so, so essentially I, I, come, I come from this one principle that information, minimizing information, predictive information or complexity of information about the future, what I call information to go, how much I really need to take with me from the big data in the past in order to act valuably is, uh, is, is a fundamental uh, variational problem subject to the value that you give me, some sort of energy function, and what I get out of it is actually a set of very constrained solutions for any system which needs to be in some sort of balanced sensing and acting. And I find it very elegant. Anyway, so we get reverse hierarchy theory, we get uh, the notion of hierarchies of states and chunking. We actually even have some, something to say about the structure of natural language, but I'll have this I'll keep it to another time. We, 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 we apply, of course, very strongly this duality between planning and, and, and perception, and we, we get for free uh, the uh, justification for the exponential discounting, and it's related to the finite uh, predictive information of the environment and hyperbolic discounting. And uh, I'll, I'll stop here. So this is essentially my conclusion. The, the world is really our perception of time and space. It has this fisheye view which means that we never think about the future and the past in the same way as we think about the far future and the far past in the same way they think about the near future and the near past. And this has a very concrete mathematical implication on the way we have to solve control problem and learning problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>